This is Bloomberg Intelligence. Spotify have always had fantastic user momentum. Solar energy, the fastest growing corner of the energy market by far. In-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. The talent wars are right around Wall Street, but the buy side is plucking off of the sell side. Aldi was the fastest growing grocery chain in the United States last year. Bloomberg Intelligence with Alex Steele and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. I'm Paul Sweeney. And I'm Kriti Gupta in for Alex Steele. Over the next hour, we're going to dig inside the big business stories impacting Wall Street and the global market. Each and every week, we provide in-depth research and data on some of the 2,000 companies and 130 industries our analysts cover worldwide. Today, we look at why the rural consumer is adding to retailers' margin potential. Plus, could Amazon Studios air and a renewed commitment to theatrical exhibition revive the U.S. box office? But first, Medtronic and Boston Scientific appear well-positioned amid an anticipated wave of pulsed field ablation, otherwise known as PFA, launching this year. For more on their potential in the space, we're joined by Bloomberg Intelligence healthcare analyst Matthew Henriksen. Matthew, you got to simplify this jargon Definition for us. Alert. What does that mean? <laughs> yes, well, it's a new technology in the electrophysiology space. Essentially, it's a tool that helps patients with atrial fibrillation. Um, and by going minimally invasive into the heart, it's able to essentially ablate or kill some of the nerves that have been seen to create the atrial fibrillation, which is ultimately a risk for stroke in the long term. All right. So I'm a Wall Street guy, and I know BI is a, a data-driven business. What's the size of this market? Well, it ended 2022 at about $6 billion. But given the momentum with the legacy technology and then augmenting that with the new PFA technology that's going to be coming into the market shortly, we could see this reach to $10 billion by 2025. $10 billion by 2025. Wow. Okay. So walk us through the players then involved in that. Yeah. So um, some of the major companies that are is uh, Medtronic and Boston Scientific, which mm -hmm. we talked about earlier. Um, there's also Johnson & Johnson and then Abbott. So those are kind of your four main uh, participants in this market. There's so many different types of ways to treat the, the disease and if it gets to a more severe state. Um, there's some other smaller companies like Atricure and um, Acutus. But yeah, the big four are uh, Medtronic, Boston, Abbott, and Johnson & Johnson. Where are they in terms of getting product to market and you know kind of what is the, the kind of the testing and approval procedure well some of these products are already out in the market okay. um, and so the kind of the traditional technology that's out there is um, there's radio frequency or it's called RF ablation and that's using heat to kill the nerves in the heart um, there's also um, cryoablation which is using freezing technology to do the same uh, mechanism and so you have you know Abbott Boston Johnson & Johnson, Medtronic, they all have various technology out there currently. Um, the three that are going to be coming out with this new pulse field ablation, which is using um, electrowaves to um, ablate the heart, is uh, Medtronic should be out first. Um, they had their data presented uh, just this weekend at uh, the cardiology conference, ACC. Did you go to that? Uh, I was there, yep. Uh, See, these now, the conferences I go to as a media analyst, we're in the desert, we're in Vegas, we're <laughs> having parties. When these healthcare geeks go to conferences, it's over a weekend and they work all the time. Well, that's that's not my fault. That, the doctors want their billable that's, hours. That's so, what, okay. Yeah, that, I, so I, when you say a healthcare conference, that, that's not what the most people do. No. You and guys it, work. And it's actually funny because most of the time it's actually the doctors in the back. They're having a good time. Okay. It's us finance geeks that are in the front row with our computers <laughs> out typing away as we're trying to figure out how to decipher this data, what it means for the stocks. Uh, but yeah, no, Medtronic posted data that seemed good enough to get to FDA approval sometime this year. Um, so they will be the first in the U.S. Uh, with a pulse field ablation product. Um, and then we should see some data from both J&J &J and Boston Scientific later this year. Well, it's interesting. Just let's take a step back for just a second here and talk about just the space in biotech broadly, because it feels like one of the themes here has been diversify your kind of products as much as possible, especially in this post-COVID era. And it feels like there's almost a race to do that. Is anyone winning that race right now? Uh, from a breaths perspective, I think Medtronic will be the one out ahead. It will, by the time they have their pulse field ablation out, they'll have key technology in all three segments. Um, so they'll be the first with the pulse field ablation. Their cryoablation is kind of already ahead in the market as they kind of have more indications for what it can treat. Um, one of the things we haven't mentioned yet is that 
any of these cardiac ablation technology, you're not usually supposed to use it until they've tried antiarrhythmic drugs and then they just fail. Either they don't work or the patient decides not to use them. Then they can use ablation. Medtronic's the only one out there that's got a first-line therapy option so you can go directly to using this their ablation technology um, instead of trying to use a kind of a smorgasbord of drugs, let's say. So this pulsed field ablation uh, products, are they materially moving the needle for these companies or is it just part of their broad portfolio? Uh, for the bigger companies, it's part of their broader portfolio, but I mean, you can see revenue growth go from you know 4% going to 5%, which is a big, you know, that's something that's big for um, these companies. Investors want to see that revenue growth go from a mid single digit growth to a high single digit growth. So anytime you have a product that can help um, accelerate that growth rate, investors are going to like that. And then for the, some of the smaller companies that we also mentioned, Atricure and um, Acutus, those are just those are the key products for their portfolio. So that anything good for them with regards to that data, that will help their top line growth. Fascinating stuff. Paul, I got to say, I think the smartest people may just be healthcare analysts because uh, yeah. they're doing all this but medical you jargon. You can't talk to them. They're not <laughs> they know something that we don't. Uh, our thanks to Bloomberg Intelligence healthcare analyst Matthew Henriksen, and we wish him the best of luck with all these uh, fancy names for all these fancy medicines. All right, let's turn now to diversity, where financing costs and executive pay are being used to drive metric. For more, we're joined by Bloomberg Intelligence senior ESG strategist Shaheen Contractor. Shaheen, we talk about ESG, environmental, social governance issues. It seems to wax and wane in terms of its importance in the marketplace. Let's talk about diversity here. Where are we, where are companies, where are boards of directors in terms of trying to improve diversity in their workforce? Sure, Paul. So I think one of the most effective ways to drive ESG or actually anything is by linking executive compensation to it. I mean, if my bonus is linked to it, I'm going to do it. Yep. <laughs> and the one thing we see is, in the U.S. at least, an increasing number of companies are linking diversity to their pay. So just as an example, of the Russell 1000, we found that of the companies here that link ESG to executive pay, 40% included diversity and inclusion factor. Now, I will say this is really interesting because we did this in 2019, and that number was 19%. Mm -hmm. So it went from 19 to 40. So I was all set to write this note saying diversity, one of the least included, and that totally changed. Talk to us about just the U.S. versus non-U.S. I feel like I'm hearing more pushback on broad ESG themes than I am in in Europe. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So... One example is regulators, for example. So Europe has continued to push diversity forward with board quotas. So certain share directors on boards have to be women. And in the U.S. tried to introduce that, I feel a couple of years back, California tried to do that and they were shut down. I Mm -hmm. think they faced regulatory backlash. And uh, NASDAQ tried to do that. I think they also faced regulatory challenges. So the U.S. definitely is sort of a step behind in terms of the regulatory push. Though if you ask me, has Europe's board quotas been impactful and trickled down and created a more diverse workforce? I'm not really sure. Well, I want to continue that theme of kind of the U.S. versus Europe, because it feels like even though Europe might be more receptive to ESG, are they receptive to the diversity part of that? It feels like perhaps there's an environmental preference in Europe, whereas more diversity pushes in the U.S. That, That is, you're right. So there's a big environmental focus in Europe, I'll give you an example. If you look at diversity funds, if we try to find a diversity fund that allocates to Europe, there's almost nothing. And this is very flipped because ESG funds tend to be very Europe domiciled. And then when you look at gender, it's totally the opposite. A lot of Canadian based, a lot of US based, and Europe has this gap. Uh, Those Canadians. (laughs) Yeah. Jamie Dimon was on Bloomberg Radio and Television this past week, uh, speaking at one of his JP Morgan conferences. And he basically said he loves Florida. He loves Texas. He loves doing business. And they're hiring more and more people into those markets. They are, quote, unquote, business friendly. Yeah. When you hear something like that, what do you think? I I don't know. I mean... ESG has become, I'm thinking of it from an ESG lens, yes, right? it's yeah. become so political. I feel like all these politics and, you know, Florida and Texas and what's happening there really has nothing to do with ESG. And it's such a shame that it's been brought into this mix. Do you think companies are pushing back at all on some of these uh, issues? They, ESG had so much momentum over the last, I'm going to yeah. say, decade roughly. 
Yeah. Um, maybe it, it feels like maybe losing a little bit of momentum. I feel like companies are sort of stuck in the middle, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like BlackRock is, I, I call it sort of between the devil and the deep blue sea. <laughs> So I feel like companies are just stuck in the middle and you have these states and I would say it's a little bit of a polarized divide like Chicago and some of the states are that the pension funds have chosen to divest fossil fuels and then you have Florida who's doing the complete opposite. So it's it's a bit of a divide. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Shaheen Contractor, ESG Analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. Coming up on the program, could a cloudy box office get clearer this year? We'll find out next. You're listening to Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. You can access Bloomberg Intelligence via BIGO on the terminal. I'm Kriti Gupta. And I'm Paul Sweeney. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch us Saturdays at noon Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts. All right, the domestic box office has gotten off to a slow start this year, but a better supply of films, a renewed commitment to theatrical exhibition, and Amazon Studios' release of Air could energize the industry. For more on what to expect, we're joined by Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Media Analyst, Geetha Ranganathan. So, Geetha, give us just... You know, one industry that was hit so hard by the pandemic was uh, the movie business. Talk to us about where we are. Are people going back to the movie theaters these days? Yeah, Paul, uh, people are actually going back, and there's good news and bad news. The good news is domestic box office revenue this year is up more than 37% versus last year. The bad news is it's still down about 22% versus pre-pandemic levels versus 2019. Um, So, you know, it's come back, but not come back fully. Uh, And that's kind of the big question now in everybody's minds. Well, when it comes to kind of where movies are actually released, I remember Warner Brothers, for example, was at this enormous controversy, kind of the tail end of, I want to say the first round of COVID, where the idea was, is it more profitable to go to the movies or go on the streaming platforms? Is that becoming more of an economies of scale type of business, the streaming platforms? So I think now the whole mindset seems to have changed. So you're absolutely right. Uh, During the pandemic, Warner did make a decision to release all of its movies day and date onto their streaming platform, which was HBO Max. Um, But they've actually walked that strategy back right now. And uh, most studios uh, we've seen have actually made this commitment to theatrical exhibition. And it's a little bit of, uh, you know, different things happening in the industry. One thing is, of course, movie going is coming back. So it kind of makes sense to put your uh, movies in the theaters where people can watch it. The second thing, though, and I think this is more important, is that... uh, you know, all of these content companies are no longer so hyper-focused on just streaming numbers. Profitability is important, and studios are going back to kind of reprioritizing theatrical revenue over streaming subscriptions because that's where they can maximize profit. So are we going to get a release schedule like we had before the pandemic? I'm not sure what a typical year would be, but are we going to get as many films released into theatrical window as we did pre-pandemic? Yes, that's a really important and a great point, Paul, because, of course, uh, the pandemic kind of destroyed demand uh, because people couldn't obviously go to the theaters. But it also kind of uh, hurt supply quite a bit because there were so many COVID-related production stoppages, production delays. And we know it typically takes about two years to create a film. And so what happened was in, you know, when we kind of came back after the pandemic, like especially in 2022, um, there was just not enough product. Um, and typically what we've seen is pre-pandemic, on average, we've seen studios kind of release about uh, 135 wide releases. Uh, so that went, or, uh, that obviously fell drastically during the pandemic. Uh, it climbed back up to about 80 wide releases in 2022. And this year, uh, most industry experts are projecting that it'll rise about 30%. So it'll go up to about 105, 110 wide releases. So still not quite up to the mark of pre-pandemic, but it's definitely getting there. Keith, let's talk about some of the players in this business here. Disney Studios versus, say, Amazon Studios. Are they employing different strategies? Yeah, so Disney is really the, uh, you know, the dominant force here. Uh, so along with the Fox Studios, which they acquired, they make up about 40 to 45% of the box office. And just with, you know, 
uh, they've always they've kind of defined how I think the domestic box office kind of sets its strategy. Uh, and just with Bob Iger now back, he has always been a huge proponent of the theatrical exhibition model. Um, and so just kind of having him back, uh, you know, I think it gives a lot of confidence to industry, uh, you know, to, to people in the industry as well as to exhibitors that, you know, theatrical exhibition will be prioritized. With Amazon, it's a little bit different. So Amazon actually acquired MGM Studios for about $8.5 billion. Uh, and so, you know, I think everybody was kind of scratching their heads what their real strategy would be. Is Was this really just a move to kind of acquire the library so that they could throw it on Prime? Uh, were they actually looking to take some of those films and put them in theaters? Uh, and it looks like Amazon is going to kind of stick with a, a traditional strategy. So they, after their MGM acquisition, they also announced that they are planning to uh, allocate about a billion dollars or so uh, on an annual basis to put out about 12 to 15 movies for theaters. And that's actually really good news for uh, exhibitors because now you have more supply, you have more output from, you know, studios other than just the big six. The idea being that, you know, this move could also act as an impetus to other uh, streamers, maybe a Netflix, maybe an Apple, to start putting some of their movies that they're currently just showing on their streaming uh, platforms into theaters. Keitha, has Hollywood rethought maybe when they release films? Because, you know, for the longest time it was obviously the, uh, the the summer was where the big blockbusters come and then maybe you're around the holidays as well. Has consumer behavior changed at all or and are the studios rethinking any of that? No, that's a great point. I think uh, summer is still the the mainstay of, of Hollywood. I mean, 45% of annual box office receipts come from the summer period. The holiday season, of course, in, in uh, November tends to be another very important season. That makes about 25%. But you're absolutely right, because uh, studios are more and more programming around shoulder, you know, the, the shoulder periods. They, they don't want to necessarily compete uh, over or, or kind of have this crowding out effect. So they're trying to make sure that there's a more steady and consistent release of films and that in turn also um, actually influences consumer behavior because once you know you start going back to the movies and then you have all this uh, in cinema marketing then you're uh, you, know, you tend to go back to the cinemas more often so, so they're trying to do it in a much more consistent and a, and a more steady supply of films. And Geetha, how do we account then for the international exposure? I mean, we're talking about these big box office releases, but releases, say, at the Cannes Film Festival or Berlin or, um, you know, a big Hollywood movie in India, for example. How much value do the international releases add to Hollywood? It absolutely has a huge impact, and especially as most of these companies don't just have a theatrical release, but they're also kind of finally going to bring this to their streaming platform. So creating that that word of mouth uh, through theatrical exhibition is so important for all of these studios because it then helps drive ancillary revenues. Uh, for Disney, it's not just selling DVDs or um, uh, you, you know electronic rentals. It's also kind of bringing those properties to their theme parks. Uh, so it obviously, there's this huge flyway effect. So I, I think international is absolutely important. Uh, remember right now about 65% of uh, global box office comes in from you know international uh, territories versus about a third from the U.S. Um, so while the U.S. is still singularly the most important market, obviously China and so many of these other uh, developing markets are also super important. And you know studios are uh, kind of definitely prioritizing um, overseas releases as well. How about China, Keitha? Because the rising tensions between the U.S. and China, are they still accepting uh, U.S. films? And are people actually going to go see them now that it's reopened? It was pretty uh, tricky, actually, the past year or so. In 2022, we almost had no Hollywood releases, but it's actually picked up uh, uh, this year. So I think we're pretty much uh, getting to a normal state, or at least that's what we're hearing uh, from from some of the industry experts. So I, I think we're kind of going to get back to like a regular cadence as far as, you know, uh, releases in China for some of the Hollywood films. All right. What's some of the big upcoming films that Hollywood thinks are going to be blockbusters? So we just had Creed, uh, which actually uh, broke a lot of the uh, expectations. But the big ones that we're really looking for is Guardians of the Galaxy, which comes out in May. We're thinking that makes about $400 million. And then, of course, you have the Indiana Jones movie that also comes out in, in June, uh, which could again make about you know $400 million or so. So those are two big, uh, big ones that we're looking for uh, this year. 
All right. I, you know, I, I'm going back to the, the movies. I'm going to the theater. How about you, Pretty? Yeah, um, I mean to. I really do. <laughs> okay. And then I kind of get into my bed, and I'm getting all warm next to my dog. And you can't take your dog to the movies. No, no. So. All right. We'll figure it out. But Hollywood's <laughs> back, uh, which is good news. Our thanks to Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Media Analyst, Geetha Ranganathan. Coming up on the program, we discuss the benefits of targeting the rural consumer. You're listening to Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2,000 companies and 130 industries. You can access Bloomberg Intelligence via BI Go on the terminal. I'm Paul Sweeney. And I'm Kriti Gupta. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Intelligence Podcast. Catch the program Saturdays at noon Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the TuneIn app, Bloomberg.com, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. We'll be here each and every week at this time, tapping into our Bloomberg Intelligence analysts, covering some 2,000 companies and 130 industries worldwide. Retailers that strategically target the rural customer may be better positioned to extend sales gains and expand margin in the near and longer term than peers. For more on this, we're pleased to welcome Bloomberg Intelligence REITs and Consumer Hardlines analyst Lindsay Dutch. So, Lindsay, talk to us about kind of the retail space today. The consumer you know, has been through a lot over the last several years, certainly benefited from stimulus checks and other incentives, savings. Where is the consumer now and what's the outlook? Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, So the consumer, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty going on right now in terms of, you know, what we expect going into the year. There's a lot of conservative outlooks from different companies, but retailers that outperformed last year in 2022, you know, included some companies like Dollar General, Tractor Supply, who really target sort of the rural customer. And we ran a survey that, you know, to dive deep into this customer and how they may differ from counterparts. And we really discovered, you know, that they have very strong loyalty um, and it's a growing community. And those attributes are really positive for these retailers that target that customer. And that could be a positive in 2023 when there is a lot of uncertainty. Well, Lindsay, I felt like one of the big themes of the last year has been this divergence in people's wealth. When you're talking about kind of the higher income consumer spending far, far more than a lower income consumer that's really feeling the pinch of inflation, is that divergence snapping back? Yes, it's interesting. One of the most fascinating things from this survey that we ran with a test Um, You know, we asked people, you know, various macro type of questions. And one of the questions was, you know, do you consider yourself wealthy? And very interestingly enough, you know, where you live had a strong um, part of the answers that we got. People that lived in more urban areas definitely skewed towards, you know, considering themselves wealthy. And we also asked about inflation and how that's affected, you know, how you consider your own financial position. And interestingly enough, the rural customers actually skewed to say that they felt less impacted by inflation than, you know, people from the mid-size and urban areas. So, Lindsay, in your research, I came across a company I had not heard of before, and I want you to explain to me what they do and kind of what's the story. Tractor Supply Company. This is a real company in terms of market cap. (laughs) TSCO is the stock symbol. It's got a market capitalization of $25 billion. Tell us about this company and kind of what you found in your survey work. Yeah, so this company has, you know, been rapidly growing. Um, You know, they still have a relatively small store fleet, about 2,100 stores. You know, that's you know, less than half of like Walmart's U.S. Uh, store fleet alone, uh, way less than Dollar General. Um, but they are expanding pretty rapidly, and we see you know tremendous growth upside for them. Um, you know, they do target this rural customer. They they sell a lot of um, products, you know, for that rural customer, but also a lot of like pet food um, for all different types of animals. Um, that's a big mover in their business. Um, Also tools and and a lot of the same categories that Walmart would have, um, including apparel. Um, And I think, you know, we've seen, you know, a movement in, you know, the world, you know, there is like this sort of sway towards that country lifestyle. And that has certainly benefited Tractor a lot. Um, and, And they are taking share from Walmart and Dollar General as they open stores, you know, based on the results that we saw in our survey. 
you know, Paul, I'm reading this research and I see this headline here that I really love. Reminds me of my dad. Over 57 percent would like to have more land. Fewer neighbors. <laughs> yep. Uh, and I can't tell you how many times, Lindsay, my dad is in, oh, you know, if I just had a few acres of land, never saw another human in my life, I'd be great. Uh, and here I am, his daughter in a, you know, New York City life. Um, Lindsay, talk to us a little bit about how that kind of sentiment affects where you shop. Right. So um, one of the key things that we saw, you know, comparing um, a rural customer versus, you know, a more urban customer is, you know, the rural customers tend to be extremely loyal. Um, You know, they tend to shop at the same stores over and over again. They send tend to shop in the store versus online. You know, urban, we saw, you know, a much stronger skew towards whatever's convenient, you know, maybe whatever that's convenient on your way home from work or when you're out, you know, doing other things, whatever you're passing by, you'll pop in and also a stronger um, preference to shop online. So we did see sort of that split and that loyalty, you know, again, going back to tractor supply, um, and some of those names that target the rural customer, that loyalty is really, really important because that can really drive margin. You know, they obviously have to work to acquire new customers, but they don't have to run, you know, big, broad discounts to continuously draw people into the store because once they attract that customer, they they have them for a long time. Inflation is a, a big issue, a big headwind for most people. And I would think it would be for perhaps some lower income in, in particular, given that, you know, inflation really cuts into their real income. What did your survey respondents kind of respond in terms of how inflation is impacting them and maybe their purchasing habits? You know, we definitely did see, you know, everybody is looking for value and low prices. Inflation obviously plays into that. A lot of these rural customers are Walmart shoppers because of that value. Um, So we see that inflation angle coming through. Um, I also think, you know, a lot of their expenditures, you know, are skewed towards necessities. So we're seeing them shop at these stores that, you know, where they're really buying things that they need over things that they want. But they also, you know, when we think about that rural customer, they love that value. That value is paramount for them. But there was other factors that kind of came through as really important on how and and where they chose to shop. And that included stuff like um, service. You know, tractor supply really kind of shined through on the service angle. Um, So did Lowe's, actually, um, over Home Depot. Um, And I think the other factor there is also, you know, the proximity of the stores. So companies like Walmart and Dollar General really have humongous store fleets and kind of more cater to these customers. And they also cater towards value and that inflation type angle. And, And we see that coming through as, you know, top places for them to shop. All right, Lindsay, 30 seconds here. Talk to us a little bit about how if you start to see kind of an expansionary economy, a little bit more optimism in consumer spending, does that then pull from, say, the bid into Walmart, which is kind of known for its uh, kind of low cost products? Yes. I, yeah. So I think that um, that's where, you know, when you think about a tractor supply versus a Walmart, a tractor is a little bit of like more of a higher price. They really go more for that service angle on the customer. And I think that's a situation where Tractor could really shine. You know, they have really strong margins, um, but they're not as much of a value player as Walmart is. And they are really sort of expanding into more affluent markets, just looking to draw on just you know, everybody that is, you know, wants to be on the Yellowstone show and, and kind of craving that uh, right. ranch life. <laughs> Certainly something to keep an eye on. Speaking of craving uh, that life, Paul Sweeney's always wanted to be a Walmart sure. grader uh, when he retires. That will, it's the dream. That will happen. <laughs> Lindsay Dutch, Bloomberg Intelligence REITs and Consumer Hardlines Analyst, we thank you so much. Let's turn now to the chip sector, which has seen lasting risk amid tensions between the U.S. and China. For more on the topic of a looming tariff renewal and potential incentives for U.S. manufacturing, let's welcome Bloomberg Intelligence ESG trade analyst Clelia Imperiali. Clidia, thanks so much for joining us here. Just give us a kind of a little bit of a, a review, if you will, about the current tariff situation on China and its chip business. Um, the antagonism of the U.S. and China in semiconductor space uh, is gaining increasing importance. 
especially because as you mentioned um, semiconductors is such a key technology um, with applications in many other industries uh, briefly talking about the domestic uh, aspect um, a bit along the lines of what we we see happening on other critical industries like solar through the Inflation Reduction Act uh, on semiconductors the U.S. Uh, domestic policy is uh, steered towards encouraging an increase of domestic production and and generally towards the reshoring of the manufacturing to either tax incentives or subsidies. And the ultimate goal really is to reduce the dependency of the national industry from foreign supply. Now, this is the domestic side, but it can take quite some time for a national output to raise its shares uh, in a significant way, especially in a context of um, rapid technological developments and growing demand. So what I'm focusing on my research instead is the U.S. actions that are taking place at foreign level to trade policy measures because those can actually have a much more short-term impact on competitiveness, supply and prices in a given industry. And so on this front, um, in the semiconductor space, we find two main dynamics. One is the curtailing of imports from China through tariffs applied on Chinese goods that are still in place since the Trump presidency. And the other one is the export restrictions adopted last October by the U.S. and gradually followed by other countries, uh, such as in uh, the Netherlands and Japan uh, at the beginning of this year. These last measures are really significant because the ultimate effect is to counter the rise of the Chinese semiconductor profile at global level. You know, if you look at the numbers there, Despite an incredible internal demand and record levels of sales globally, China is actually still largely confined to the low other value steps of the global semiconductor industry supply chain, right. which are packaging and assembly. While despite losing ground on global sales and production shares, the U.S. still lead on the technological advancements and still account for 50% of the design um stage taking place uh, globally. So blocking the transfer of know-how to China um, through the measures that have been adopted in the last month, such as license requirements, NTP and personnel transfer restrictions, can really have an impact on the future equilibrium right. of the global industry. Speaking of that impact, I'm really interested on the timeline here because it's fascinating to see talk about geopolitics, even though some of this manufacturing capacity from my understanding, is really only being brought into the United States, say, 10 years down the road to really fully create that kind of industry or even the startings of that industry. In the meantime, how helpful is it really to the semiconductor industry? Well, I mean, as I mentioned, this uh, are all changes that take place uh, over uh, a significant um, amount of time. Uh, you need, of course, to reshuffle investment, to uh, build regional, new regional supply chains. And in this sense, I think um, one important aspect of these measures is not just the companies that would be losing in the short and the midterm, but of, which, of course, are both um, American companies with uh, sales exposure to the United States or um, um, with uh, significant supply exposures, although this is less of an important issue uh, to China. Uh, but there are actually companies uh, that play an important role in the global semiconductor industry like Taiwan or even other um, emerging industries in uh, other East Asian countries that can actually step in um, in, uh, in this uh, in the middle of these tensions. And so this, I think, are very important um, spaces to watch in the next few years. And how about in the interim, clearly? I mean, is there – has the industry, the semiconductor industry, the chip industry, has it been able to move significant uh, or, or source chips from other areas, whether it's other parts of Asia or – how has the industry done in that regard? Yeah, this is this is interesting because uh, officially, from a trade international trade law uh, point of view, it would be forbidden, it would be legal uh, to uh, bypass the restrictions on China through other countries. But what happens in reality is that it's very difficult to trace back um, uh, suppliers when uh, in a in a very um, in such a, a complex supply chain at the global level. Yep. So as a matter of fact, uh, many other firms, as I was mentioning, in countries like Taiwan right. uh, is, is, um, is one of others, but can actually um, 
offer uh, and do uh, at the moment uh, participate a lot in this uh, in this uh, dynamic. And what about when it comes to we're trying to trade barriers in the last, say, 30 seconds or so here? Talk to us about some of the other parties affected by this outside of, say, China and the U.S. Um, there is a trickle effect for companies uh, that uh, do not belong to these two uh, countries. And uh, this is uh, particularly uh, the case for countries that are kind of allied to the United States because they are very likely to put similar um, measures in place. And uh, we've just seen uh, um, this happening in uh, in Japan and the Netherlands, but uh, there is a, a high likelihood that these measures would be followed um, uh, in different ways uh, by other Western countries. Um, so in this sense, um, high exposure to China, whether from the supply side or from the revenue side, uh, can be uh, a potential weakness uh, for companies in other regions and uh, in Europe particularly. All right, clearly, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Bloomberg Intelligence ESG trade analyst Clelia Imperiali. That's this week's edition of Bloomberg Intelligence on Bloomberg Radio, providing in-depth research and data on 2,000 companies in 130 industries. And remember, you can access Bloomberg Intelligence via BI Go on the terminal. I'm Paul Sweeney. And I'm Kriti Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.